Welcome, everybody. This is the last um, lecture for the Geriatric Healthcare Lecture Series this spring. So hopefully we'll get our funding and you'll see us again next year. My name is Barbara Cochran and I'm the director of the Deternier Center for Healthy Aging. And as usual, today I'm representing the Northwest Geriatric Education Center, which is sponsoring this lecture series. Um, and today I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Michael Chen. Um, Dr. Chen is a UW Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Cardiology, and he has special expertise in treating older patients with cardiovascular disease. You may have heard from him in past lecture series, in fact. He earned a bachelor's degree from Haverford College in Pennsylvania and then attended the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, where he learned, earned an MA and a PhD in psychology. His dissertation research focused on the influence of age and gender on patient-physician interaction, before then entering medical school to obtain his MD. He came to the UW in 1999 for an internship and residency in internal medicine and then also completed fellowships in gerontology and geriatric medicine and cardiology here, and we're glad he's decided to stay. He's board certified in cardiovascular disease, and today he's going to talk about coronary artery disease in older adults. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I have nothing to disclose. Um, my objectives are uh, that by the conclusion of the talk, you'll be able to describe the pathophysiology of coronary artery disease, understand the risk factors and treatments of for coronary artery disease in older adults, and understand understand how the presentation and management of coronary disease can differ in older adults as opposed to in younger folks. Um, just some general points. Um, the presentation of coronary disease in older adults can be atypical or sort of non-textbook. Um, few patients who are older uh, than 80 years have been included in our large randomized trials. A large percentage of eligible elderly Clearly, our older patients are not receiving evidence-based therapy. And older adults often stand to benefit the most from therapy, but also have increased risk from that therapy. And then I have a special note to myself here to point out this little asterisk, which is going to appear on key slides in the talk. Um, and, uh, you know, whenever you talk for an extended period of time and have lots of slides, you can get lost in them. Um, but if you focus on the ones that have the asterisks, then those are sort of big take-home types of points. So we're going to talk a bit about epidemiology, manifestations, risk factors, and risk factor management, including secondary prevention, and then a bit about acute care. So coronary artery disease is a huge public health problem. It's the most um, preventable of the cardiovascular diseases and is responsible for a large burden of mortality and morbidity. You can see over 400,000 deaths per year, uh, over a quarter of which are due to myocardial infarction, um, and there are over a million new MIs per year, um, a good deal of which are first-time infarcts. Um, about 16 and a half million Americans have documented coronary artery disease, um, and asymptomatic disease is even more prevalent. It's estimated that by 2020, coronary heart disease will become the leading cause of death worldwide. You can see uh, in this pie chart of different cardiovascular diseases how big a piece of the pie or section of the pie um, is taken up by coronary heart disease, almost half. And coronary heart disease, cardiovascular disease, and other, uh, and is uh, an extremely um, carries an extremely high burden with age, uh, particularly you can see here on this um, graph, stroke and heart disease. Stroke and heart disease um, comprise a good deal of um, the causes of death in older adults. And then you can also see that age is a very potent uh, component of risk for coronary heart disease and how dramatically the incidence increases, or the prevalence rather, increases um, with age. So atherosclerosis uh, occurs in 
all of our arteries um, and appears early in childhood and correlates with the presence of risk factors. Autopsy studies of trauma victims have demonstrated fatty streaks, which are the precursors of atherosclerotic plaques, in a high percent of young men. But the good news is, is that the atherosclerotic process can be greatly slowed by preventative measures. This is a picture of an artery which is narrowed. Um, the original lumen was about this big. Um, and this is atherosclerotic placking with this yellowish tinted lipid core and uh, a fibrous cap. And then this is now what the lumen has been reduced to. Here's just a cartoon of the same thing, um, a lipid rich core, and in this case, a thin fibrous cap. This is uh, a prototypical vulnerable plaque, one which may rupture and cause an acute coronary syndrome that we'll talk about. And then a more stable plaque with a very, uh, a much smaller lipid core and a thick fibrous cap. This is a pathologic specimen um, of a plaque which has ruptured, uh, resulting in thrombus formation. This thin fibrous cap um, broke open, uh, exposed the contents to the bloodstream, and resulted in activation of the clotting cascade and thrombosis. So what are some manifestations of coronary artery disease? Well, um, the cardinal symptom of coronary artery disease is chest pain, or pressure, um, often referred to as angina pectoris. Uh, it's typically exertional, relieved by rest, or with nitroglycerin. Um, acute coronary syndromes result from unstable plaques, which may have ruptured or fissured, and as I mentioned, exposed uh, the inner contents of the plaque to the bloodstream, resulting in uh, a sudden decrease in myocardial perfusion, a sudden decrease in blood flow and oxygen delivery to the muscle, resulting in chest pain. If there's enough ischemia, enough lack of blood flow or oxygen to the heart muscle, then myocardial infarction will will ensue, and that can be detected um, by blood tests. And there are two types of myocardial infarction, ST elevation MI, where the artery is completely blocked, uh, and non-ST elevation MI, where for the most part there's still some perfusion to that region of myocardium. So here's our first key slide, uh, and it is a question, which you can answer to yourselves, or you can say it out loud. Uh, which of the factors for coronary artery disease that has been identified in younger adults, risk factors, is not a risk factor in patients over equal to or over 75 years old? A, hypertension. B, dyslipidemia. C, diabetes. D, cigarette smoking. E, physical inactivity. And F, obesity. I'll let you think about that for a moment. And this is actually a trick question, because all of these are risk factors in older adults as they are in younger adults. And we're going to talk about these. So we often classify um, risk factors as modifiable and non-modifiable. Um, and, and so we'll go over those and talk a little bit about um, emerging risk factors or non-traditional ones. So the modifiable risk factors are those um, that I mentioned. Non-modifiable risk factors include family history, uh, of coronary disease, um, gender, male gender is a risk factor, and age, increasing age. Some other emerging risk factors that you may have heard about or read about are homocysteine, inflammatory factors, and infectious factors. We're going to focus on the left side of this slide, though, for the most part. So we'll talk a little bit about hypertension. Hypertension is extremely common, um, uh, particularly as we age, with a prevalence um, about 70% um, in uh, those over 65 years of age, with a lifetime risk of 90%. It's the most prevalent modifiable risk factor with the greatest population attributable risk for coronary disease, cerebrovascular disease, and peripheral arterial disease. In fact, over 70% of older adults with incident MI, stroke, or acute aortic syndromes, as well as heart failure, have a diagnosis of hypertension. 
The prevalence, as I mentioned, increases dramatically with age. You can see age over 75 prevalence exceeds 75 percent. The blood pressure relationship to risk of cardiovascular disease is continuous, consistent, and independent of other risk factors. And it's been estimated that each increase of 20 over 10 millimeters of mercury doubles the risk of cardiovascular disease across the entire blood pressure range, starting from a blood pressure of 115 over 75. There are multiple benefits to the lowering of blood pressure to the treatment of high blood pressure, including a reduction in stroke a reduction in myocardial infarction, and a reduction in heart failure that in some studies um, is about a 50 percent reduction. In the landmark HIVET trial of nearly 4,000 patients who are over 80 years of age with systolic blood pressures over 160 millimeters of mercury, treatment was associated with a nearly 40 percent reduction in fatal stroke, uh, to over 20 percent decrease in all-cause mortality, and a 64 percent decrease in heart failure. JNC7 um, uh, defined uh, ranges for blood pressure, including normal, prehypertensive, stage 1, and stage 2 hypertensive um, hypertension. JNC8 actually didn't readdress um, the ranges and focused <laughs> much more um, on treatment and thresholds for treatment. The JNC8 guidelines, which were generally aimed at a general population, suggest that for those over 60 years of age, a goal blood pressure of less than 150 over 90 is appropriate. And this is different um, than other guidelines that you may have seen, including the American Association of Hypertension guidelines, which have a similar goal um, for older patients, but their age cutoff is actually 80 years. Um, and in the ACCHA and ASH um, hypertensive, hypertension in coronary disease guidelines, they have a goal um, of less than 150 over 80 for those over 80 years. Um, and for younger coronary disease patients, including those 65 to 79, a goal of less than 140 over 90. Um, the statement specifically um, kind of, quote, allows for a, a, a tighter goal for some younger patients uh, especially those who are at particularly high risk. And I think the bottom line with regard to hypertension is that um, blood pressure goals should be individualized. Um, we should try to treat our older patients, particularly those with comorbidities or who are frail, um, uh, with antihypertensive um, interventions, whether it's lifestyle changes as well as medications. Um, and we should get them to whatever goal we think is most appropriate based on their overall risk profile. Um, uh, uh, slowly as opposed to very quickly so that we can ensure that they are tolerating our therapies. It was a repeat slide that snuck in there. Um, there are multiple benefits to lifestyle modifications on blood pressure. Most of these studies did not specifically um, study older folks, but um, in the studies of these interventions, weight reduction, uh, the DASH diet, sodium restriction, physical activity, and moderation of alcohol consumption have all been associated with significant decreases in um, blood pressure. Uh, this is a table which you can refer to for uh, particular compelling indications for specific classes of antihypertensives, which may be useful in choosing uh, initial or secondary um, medications in older patients who will often need more than one medication to uh, meet their hypertensive control goals. So here are some pearls about hypertensive, hypertension in older adults. Um, because of physiologic changes in the arteries, essentially stiffness that accompanies aging, systolic hypertension is the predominant type of hypertension seen in older adults and is uh, the principal driver of risk. And it's seen in 90 percent of those who are over 70 years of age. Older women's hypertension is more difficult to control um, and uh, may require more frequent monitoring uh, and potentially more aggressive drug therapy. Um, and in fact, most older adults will actually require at least two agents to achieve control of their <laughs> blood pressure. And another 
uh, pearl is that NSAID use and dietary indiscretion can really worsen control, and um, and this can be a particular problem in folks with comorbid arthritis, for example, who depend on their NSAIDs um, or who uh, who use NSAIDs, and it's important to ask folks about over-the-counter medications that they may be using. Um, so I've put an asterisk on this slide because there's um, historically been um, some confusion or controversy about uh, cholesterol and older adults. Um, and that's because uh, even in younger adults, there's, uh, there's the so-called U-shaped association between total cholesterol and total mortality, such that at very low levels of cholesterol, uh, untreated, um, there's an increase risk of mortality, um, as well as in folks who have very high um, cholesterol. And the reason is because of comorbidities. So folks that um, tend to have very low cholesterol tend to have um, comorbid conditions, whether it's cancer, or malnutrition, um, et cetera. Um, uh, and this U-shaped uh, association is exaggerated in older adults, and this has led to sort of a, um, it's not really a myth, but uh, the belief that um, that abnormal cholesterol or high LDL cholesterol isn't really a risk factor in older adults, uh, when in fact it is. Uh, LDL cholesterol is strongly associated with coronary artery disease in older adults, although the relative risk of high cholesterol is less as you get older. Older adults' absolute risk of coronary disease is so high um, that it remains an important risk factor and an important target for treatment. This is um, from ATP3 and not something that I think uh, um, any of us needs to memorize, but um, lists uh, total cholesterol, LDL, and triglycerides, as well as HDL cholesterol with regard to um, sort of what's optimal, uh, thought to be optimal for health and potentially targets for treatment. Um, targets for treatment have recently um, uh, undergone a bit of a um, a revolution as well, and I'm going to talk about that after the next slide, which is um, certainly something that one doesn't need to memorize, but these are uh, multiple randomized trials of um, statin therapy, uh, and in particular, uh, those that included significant numbers of older patients, and so that's what this um, column is meant to note. Uh, and then for those who are particularly interested, you can see um, the the benefits with regard to um, cardiovascular disease endpoints. Um, so there's really good evidence for secondary prevention um, for patients with coronary artery disease uh, up to about age 85. Um, and so I uh, would advocate for treatment um, of those patients uh, unless issues like polypharmacy, comorbidity, frailty, um, make treatment seem unwise or unwanted. Uh, it's important to recognize that randomized control trial data suggest about a one to three year lag time for the benefits in for coronary disease and stroke endpoints. So if you have a patient whose um, life expectancy is significantly shorter than that, and particularly if they're experiencing any side effects, it would be reasonable to take that into consideration in terms of um, how aggressively to continue to help them, uh, to continue to treat them. Statins have also been found to reduce stroke risk and peripheral arterial disease uh, symptoms, such as claudication. Um, and there are some case series that suggest that statins can contribute to cognitive dysfunction and memory loss, uh, as well as muscle side effects that we'll talk about here. Um, and so uh, these are important things to screen for. They can be difficult to tease out. Um, but certain, sometimes um, taking a patient off a of medication, as with other side effects of medications, uh, for a period of time may be useful in terms of trying to figure out whether or you're dealing with an adverse um, drug event or not. Um, many clinical trials, uh, looking back at adverse events, didn't find a difference between um, those uh, events in older versus younger patients. Um, although aggressive lipid lowering trials um, did have higher rates of abnormal LFTs. Um, muscle abnormalities, which may range from just simple myalgias to abject rhabdomyolysis, um, 
is are more common in women, those of small stature, um, with concomitant use of fibrates, uh, and with certain of the statins that utilize the P450 system for uh, their metabolism, um, as well as those with pre-existing hepatic or liver dysfunction, um, hypothyroidism, and heavy alcohol use. And uh, we should always remember to avoid fibrates, especially gemfibrozil, in concert with statin therapy. Lipid management can also be uh, achieved with diet and exercise, including cardiac rehabilitation that I'll spend a few slides talking about. And um, there is a new risk calculator, which uh, uh, the data for which only supports its use up to age 79, which can be helpful in, in risk stratifying folks um, for therapy. On the other hand, we're talking about folks with, um, with coronary artery disease, although we're also interested in, in prevention. We're mostly talking today about secondary prevention. And these are patients that therefore have clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. These are from the new um, 2013 AHA guidelines for the use of statin therapy. Uh, and uh, in these patients, the, uh, the sole recommendation is for high intensity statin therapy um, for secondary prevention. And high intensity statin therapy uh, refers to the use of um, atorvastatin or rosuvastatin at high dose, 40 to 80 milligrams of atorvastatin, or rosuvastatin, 20 to 40. Uh, and, and these, on average, will lower LDL cholesterol by, um, by at least 50 percent and often more. The, the rest of this uh, flow chart is for um, other categories of patients. Um, but it's there for your interest. We'll say a few words about diabetes. Um, um, the prevalence of diabetes has been increasing. Um, and uh, over a third of all cases of diagnosed diabetes uh, are, those, are, are made in those who are at least 65 years of age. Uh, and in fact, <laughs> over 25 percent of those who are over 65, or at least 65, have diabetes. Um, uh, the reason for this uh, is a combination of increasing insulin resistance, as well as decreasing insulin secretion. Um, it's important to note that diabetes is a potent risk factor for coronary disease. In fact, 30 percent of older adults with diabetes also have coronary disease which is a rate two times that of non-diabetic patients. Um, these are an especially high risk, but also a very heterogeneous population, um, which, are, uh, which need individualized care. As you know, the treatment of diabetes can also entail a good deal of lifestyle interventions, including weight loss, diet, and exercise. Um, Due to the risks associated with intensive uh, control of blood sugar, hemoglobin A1C targets of 7 to 7.9 for most patients, especially those with comorbidities, um, is uh, probably more appropriate than tighter goals. Medication choices uh, can be impacted by concomitant renal hepatic disease and heart failure. Uh, and it, although glucose um, control is important, the control of concurrent hypertension and dyslipidemia may be even more critical in these patients, certainly more critical than very tight control of blood sugar, um, which carries risk in, in and of itself. Um, <clears throat> Obesity is also um, an increasing problem in the United States. You can see that rates of obesity have increased uh, pretty dramatically uh, over the last um, 10, 20 years. Uh, about a third of those over at least 65 years of age were uh, obese in um, 2007 to 2010. Uh, obesity prevalence was higher among those aged 65 to 74 compared with those who are 75 and older. Um, <coughs> although between um, those date ranges, the prevalence of obesity among older men increased. 
Um, additionally, about 33% of older uh, folks uh, were overweight, so that nearly two-thirds of seniors were either overweight or obese. Um, the reasons for this are, are um, multitudinous. Um, there is a decrease in metabolic rate as we age, uh, as well as um, perhaps uh, inertia not changing eating habits to match um, the uh, lower activity rates um, and lower metabolic rate. Um, lifetime um, habits are hard to uh, break. Medications that patients may be on may be associated with weight gain as well. Um, and uh, as with diabetes, obesity carries with it other risk factors, hypertension, dyslipidemia, et cetera. Um, and obesity is a component of the metabolic syndrome, which I'm not going to talk about specifically, um, but is a particularly adverse conglomeration or collection of risk factors with regard to atherosclerotic disease. Um, there's a complex association of obesity with total mortality, uh, which is stronger in those who are younger, um, as well as a relationship to cardiovascular mortality. The management of obesity in older adults can include diet and exercise. Um, and uh, weight loss can improve blood pressure control, glucose control, lipids, as well as to improve quality of life and improve function. Um, dietary only weight loss uh, interventions risk uh, folks losing muscle mass, which can reduce their function. So exercise um, is recommended in addition to dietary interventions, um, and particularly some uh, at least small degree of resistance training may be appropriate to forestall the loss of muscle mass. Maintenance of weight loss um, is challenging at any age. Um, just a few uh, words on smoking and smoking cessation. Um, nearly 9% of those uh, at least 65 years old are current smokers. That's about a rate about half of uh, younger adults. About 50% of um, elderly men and about 30% of women are former smokers. Um, and smoking brings with it the risk of recurrent cardiovascular uh, coronary artery disease and other vascular events, including stroke. Quitting reduces mortality by 36% and non-fatal MI by 32%. Um, as well as reducing the risks of sudden death, stroke, claudication, and declines in pulmonary function. Um, and the benefits of quitting have even been demonstrated in those who are over 80. Uh, the cardiovascular risk reduction is the most dramatic in the first one to two years after quitting. And in fact, the risk of stroke falls to near never smoker levels in about two to five years, which is pretty impressive. The most effective cessation programs involve uh, structure and group support, as well as the use of nicotine substitutes and other medications. There's limited data on these interventions in, in, uh, in the very old, however. Physical activity is extremely important, not just to improve cardiovascular health, but also to improve um, quality of life. Uh, as well. Low rates of physical activity are present in older adults, um, although physical activity improves cardiovascular risk factors and the prognosis in those who already have diagnosed disease. There are benefits to cognitive function, falls reduction, um, measures of mental health, and uh, as I mentioned previously, combinations of aerobic and endurance type training as with strength training may be ideal. Cardiac real Rehabilitation um, was developed as a systemized multimodality approach to cardiovascular risk reduction. It's usually performed after a specific cardiac event, uh, heart attack, stenting, valve surgery, heart transplant, or um, but can be prescribed for folks with stable angina. Um, there are three phases. Phase one is performed in the hospital. Phase two is the um, is the monitored exercise sessions outside the hospital, uh, and then, and then phase, so-called phase three is for folks um, in the maintenance phase. There are benefits uh, as great as a 20% reduction in all-cause mortality for those, for those folks who participate in cardiac rehabilitation, as well as a 25% reduction in cardiac mortality. 
the mechanisms for benefit for exercise in, in coronary artery disease, there are atheros anti-atherosclerotic uh, benefits, anti-ischemic for those with um, stable angina, anti-arrhythmic benefits, anti-thrombotic, psychosocial, uh, as well as uh, improvement of exercise parameters. Unfortunately, both referral and participation rates in for cardiac rehabilitation are low. There's only about a 20% <coughs> referral rate and only about 12% of Medicare patients who are eligible for cardiac rehab actually participate. Um, automated or protocol-driven referral patterns, so um, order sets that include a discharge for, for an acute coronary syndrome, for example, that automatically have a referral to cardiac rehab are the most effective. With regard to covered diagnoses um, for Medicare, those include myocardial infarction within the last 12 months, um, coronary artery bypass grafting, stable angina, valve repair replacement, angioplasty or stenting, heart or heart-lung transplant, as well as uh, the newest diagnosis, stable chronic heart failure. So we'll turn to talk about acute coronary syndromes. And we'll have a, a short case. An 84-year-old woman um, presents to the emergency room brought in by her family after experiencing two days of nausea and belching. She only informed her family of this on day two when she also began to have some left jaw discomfort, which was worse when walking around her apartment. She has a past medical history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and borderline diabetes, as well as osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, and recent complaints of memory problems. On presentation, after two sublingual nitroglycerins, uh, a full aspirin, and supplemental oxygen, she reports feeling better. Her symptoms have resolved. Her vital signs, her heart rate's 94 beats per minute. Her blood pressure is 117 over 66 millimeters of mercury. She has a respiration rate of 15 per minute, and she's satting 98% on two liters nasal cannula. Here's her electrocardiogram. <coughs> so she is presenting with an acute coronary syndrome. Uh, I briefly mentioned acute coronary syndromes as one uh, way that folks present with coronary artery disease. Acute coronary syndromes refer um, to a situation where there's a reduction in myocardial oxygen um, delivery, uh, typically as a result of ruptured plaque and thrombosis. This will result in uh, a pattern of ST elevation on an electrocardiogram or left new left bundle branch block um, as a result of a completely occluded uh, epicardial coronary artery, or non-ST elevation MI where folks uh, have some uh, perfusion to that area of myocardium so there's not complete occlusion of the coronary. Uh, and But if there is enough ischemia to result in uh, the detection of, or, or rather muscle loss, uh, that then you will be able to detect troponin um, or other cardiac enzymes in the bloodstream, uh, and so that would be called a non-ST elevation MI. If there hasn't been enough ischemia to actually cause infarction, uh, then that would be classified as unstable angina. The big family of acute coronary syndromes um, strikes about 1.6 million, uh, or causes about 1.6 million admissions per year. Um, Non-ST elevation MI MI is much more common than ST elevation MI, um, and uh, ST elevation MI is what you often will hear about, um, sort of the dramatic presentations where folks get to go to the cath lab immediately with a, um, a door to device time target uh, and so forth, whereas non-ST elevation MI, although a very important problem, um, doesn't necessarily result in um, as dramatic a uh, interventions uh, upon arrival in the emergency department. Um, older folks are much more uh, likely to have non-ST elevation MI. They're more likely to have multivessel disease, and they're more likely to have 
uh, difficult to interpret electrocardiograms, including left bundle branch block. This patient was brought to the coronary intensive care unit for monitoring. She underwent echocardiography to look at uh, for wall motion abnormalities, to look at her overall left ventricular function and her valves. Her treatment included continuation of aspirin, the addition of Plavix as an ad additional antiplatelet agent, um, uh, metoprolol, a beta blocker, lisinopril, an ACE inhibitor, uh, and atorvastatin were administered. Catheterization was discussed as, um, as she was felt to be a high-risk patient, but she declined. She was counseled regarding smoking cessation and she was referred to cardiac rehabilitation for further risk factor modification. So as I mentioned, coronary artery disease in older adults is more complex. Uh, they tend to have more calcified, tortuous vessels uh, and more multivessel coronary disease. There are higher rates of, peripheral, of concomitant peripheral arterial disease, which can make intervention more difficult. Um, and they tend to have more comorbidities, including renal dysfunction. All of that having been said, the procedural success rates for revascularization remain quite high. Uh, in fact, uh, estimates of successful PCI um, in uh, over 90% of older adults. Um, it should be noted that, uh, however, that complication rates are also higher, and that can include bleeding or other vascular complications. Revascularization with percutaneous uh, intervention or bypass surgery can have benefits in older adults um, with regard to the reduction in uh, major adverse coronary events, quality of life, um, anginal class, and health status. And that's from uh, studies, um, the acronyms such as TIME and COURAGE. Um, surgical complications are more common in older adults, particularly with um, very advanced age, and that may include prolonged intubation, inotropic dependence, um, the need for balloon pump, uh, arrhythmic complications such as atrial fibrillation, uh, as well as delirium and cognitive dysfunction. Um, the use of cabbage versus PCI, um, particularly uh, in those over 75, is, is not well studied. So here's another case. An 83-year-old woman presents um, as an urgent visit to her regular PCP's office complaining of dyspnea that began this morning. Heart rate's 90 beats per minute, blood pressure 130 over 70, 94% on room air. You obtain an ECG which shows two millimeters of lateral ST depression. You transfer her to the ER where her troponin is mildly positive and she's hospitalized for a non-STEMI. Identify the true statement. Left bundle branch block is more common in middle age than elderly patients. Type 2 MI, or the so-called supply-demand mismatch type of myocardial infarction, is less common in the elderly. Because of increased risk of catheter-related complications, lytics are preferred to cath or percutaneous intervention in the very elderly. D, in a large database, 77% of patients who are less than 65 years of age had chest pain on presentation, but only 40% of those who are older than 85 years old or E, in the elderly, ST elevation MI is more common than non-ST elevation MI. So um, as I mentioned previously, left bundle branch is more common in, in the elderly as opposed to in middle-aged patients. Um, type 2 MI refers to, as it says, your supply demand mismatch. So um, patients that have coronary disease uh, but who have a concomitant um, other condition that may uh, place an excessively high demand on the myocardium. So that might be they come in with sepsis or um, a dramatic COPD exacerbation or um, a tachyarrhythmia. Um, there's nothing active about their coronary disease, but it's present. Um, they just have less reserve. So if, have, if their demand, myocardial oxygen demand, is so great, they may actually suffer myocardial infarction as a result of that. And that's what we call type 2 MI. And that is actually more common in older adults. Um, 
Lytics aren't um, preferred in the very elderly. In fact, the very elderly are at increased risk for bleeding, including intracerebral hemorrhage uh, and other complications with Lytics. Um, and so uh, particularly because you can tailor your anticoagulant therapy um, uh, when you give, uh, when you do PCI, uh, you, which you can't really do when you give lytic therapy. It's sort of you give it or you don't. Um, and then uh, question, uh, choice E, we mentioned that non-STEMI is more common uh, in the elderly. Uh, and so um, to focus here on the fact that um, only 40% of those greater than 85 in a large myocardial infarction database actually had chest pain on presentation is important because, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, the presentation for coronary, of coronary disease can be atypical in older adults, so you have to have a high index of suspicion. Um, acute coronary syndromes account for about 35% of all deaths uh, of those who are over 65 years of age. Among people dying of ischemic heart disease, about 83% are over 65. 60% of MI deaths occur in the 6% of the population who are over 75 years. That's pretty dramatic. Um, and age is a major predictor of mortality in acute coronary syndromes. And in fact, the adjusted odds ratio, uh, the adjusted odds for in-hospital death increase by 70% for each 10-year increase in age. Unfortunately, many coronary disease trials have enrolled no patients who are over 75. So we do have data from some randomized trials or some small portions of those who were randomized, uh, as well as large international community registries. Um, clinical trials tend to enroll a relatively homogeneous population um, so that they can try to reduce the number of factors that may explain um, their results. The uh, clinical trials population, as opposed to commute those found in, patients found in the community, um, the clinical trials population population usually is younger, more often male, with less renal dysfunction, heart failure, um, prior stroke, uh, and they also have uh, a, a less uh, in the way of hypertension uh, and other hemodynamic instability in, um, on presentation. So uh, atypical symptoms are common. Chest pain is only found in about half of those who are over 85, whereas um, it's found in almost up to 90% of those who are less than 65. The primary complaint in the elderly um, is often dyspnea. So up to half of patients' um, primary complaint is shortness of breath. Um, diaphoresis is common, nausea and vomiting, syncope. Um, as a result of these atypical symptoms, as well as um, the fact that they may attribute their symptoms to other conditions, the elderly tend to present later. Um, other factors in later presentation include women, um, being a woman, uh, non-whites, and having their first cardiac event. Um, and as I mentioned with the question at the start of this section, uh, type 2 MI is more common. Um, and uh, left bundle branch block is more common in the elderly. Unfortunately, atypical presentations are associated with worse prognosis. There's an increased risk of in-hospital death. Um, for patients with an atypical presentation, presumably because of delays in treatment. Um, the, while the guidelines recommend 10 minutes to ECG for signs or symptoms of myocardial infarction, um, we know from the database and other studies that, um, that the average can be as long as 40 minutes um, and, uh, and even longer in folks who are um, of older age. Unfortunately, uh, ECGs uh, can be more difficult to diagnose, uh, or myocardial infarction can be more difficult to diagnose, and a large percentage of older patients have uh, what we think of as non-diagnostic ECGs. Complications are more common in older folks. Heart failure and shock rates increase with age. Um, free wall rupture in ST elevation MI is um, a problem that is uh, highly morbid, um, usually fatal, uh, and is uh, most common in elderly patients who present late and get lytic therapy. Um, and that has been associated with a rate of as high as 17%. 
Minor and major bleeding is also increased with age, uh, and that is because of their um, more friable blood vessels uh, and, and uh, potentially comorbidities, but also because uh, many elderly are given doses of, um, of uh, blood thinners that are too high, uh, and this increases bleeding. And that um, is particularly true of 2B3A inhibitors, such as Epsiximab, um, Eptifibatide, which we're using less and less, um, especially those that are renally cleared, uh, are associated with an increased risk of bleeding. Uh, and the, the most dreaded type of bleeding is intracranial hemorrhage, which is, um, which is seen in folks uh, who are of older age with ST elevation MI, particularly those who um, get lytic therapy and have had a prior stroke. <clears throat> so uh, there's the so-called <coughs> risk treatment paradox, um, where patients who are at the highest risk may be treated less aggressively. Um, STEMI reperfusion rates are lower in the elderly, even if ideal. I mentioned that um, ST elevation MI patients are usually rushed to the cath lab in cath lab um, uh, hospitals that have cath labs, or they're given lytic therapy uh, with um, specific door-to-balloon uh, or door-to-needle times. Um, STEMI reperfusion rates, however, are lower in the elderly, even if they're thought of as ideal. Um, Factors associated with a lack of reperfusion in addition to older age are uh, uh, female gender, a lack of chest pain, heart failure, patient preference, or other um, relative contraindications. Aspirin um, has absolute and relative benefits that are greater in the higher, highest risk populations, including the elderly, but has been seen to be prescribed less. Uh, as, as patients are older. And in fact, one study demonstrated that 24% of eligible Medicare patients um, in the chronic phase of coronary disease were not on aspirin. So here's another question. Which of the following is a class three? Uh, and um, in our uh, guidelines, class three means harm, so don't do it. Uh, recommendation level of evidence B in the 2014 non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome guidelines section on medical therapy for early hospital care. A. Nitrates should not be administered to patients with non-ST elevation MI acute coronary syndromes who recently received a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, especially within 24 hours of sildenafil or vardenafil, or within 48 hours of tadalafil. <coughs> B. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, except aspirin, should not be initiated and should be discontinued during hospitalization for non-ST elevation MI, sorry, non-ST elevation acute coronary syndromes because of the increased risk of major adverse cardiac events associated with their use. The administration of intravenous beta blockers is potentially harmful in patients with non-ST elevation ACS who have risk factors for shock. D, immediate release nifedipine should not be administered to patients with non-ST elevation acute coronary syndromes in the absence of beta blocker therapy, or E, all of the above. So I certainly don't expect that you, you guys have read through and memorized um, the non-ST elevation ACS guidelines, um, but uh, the correct answer is E, all of the above. Um, Nitrates in association with phosphodiesterase inhibitors, such as uh, Viagra, um, uh, can cause uh, severe hypotension um, uh, and hemodynamic collapse. Um, gonna, we're going to be talking more about um, NSAIDs here. Um, intravenous beta blockers uh, used to be the norm. It used to be when I was a resident, folks would come into the hospital with a myocardial infarction or a suspected myocardial infarction. They would get five milligrams of metoprolol every five minutes um, times three. Um, but this is uh, particularly um, problematic or dangerous for folks who have risk factors for shock, including old age or any, um, uh, any um, signs of heart failure or hypotension. Um, so the new guidelines um, suggest um, PO beta blockers within the first 24 hours, um, and we don't, unless there's uh, hypertension or tachyarrhythmia, we don't um, tend to administer IV beta blockers. Immediate release nifedipine was associated with an increased uh, in mortality, 
Um, and so that's, uh, that's pretty much not administered anymore. On the next several slides, we're going to talk about NSAID therapy. Um, so uh, the, um, the guidelines actually recommend not instituting and discontinuing NSAIDs for inpatients who are hospitalized with um, suspected myocardial infarction or myocardial ischemia because they're associated with, um, with bleeding and other cardiovascular events post-MI. In a nationwide registry in Denmark um, uh, of over 60,000 patients, uh, the risk of bleeding in patients who were taking NSAIDs versus no NSAIDs was um, two times higher. Um, cardiovascular risk was increased about one and a half times, and this was regardless of the antithrombotic, other antithrombotic treatments, the types of NSAIDs, or the duration of their use. Therefore, um, the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology have um, endorsed a stepped care approach to pharmacologic therapy for musculoskeletal symptoms in patients with known cardiovascular disease or risk factors for ischemic heart disease. And these, um, and this uh, stepped care uh, has a focus on um, at least trials of acetaminophen, aspirin, tramadol, uh, and low-dose short-term narcotic analgesics, non-acetylated salicylates if the former um, interventions are not uh, effective. Um, Non-COX-2 selective NSAIDs um, should then be utilized if necessary, uh, and then um, on down to the least desirable um, with regard to cardiovascular disease. Um, other uh, recommendations are to select patients at the lowest risk of thrombotic events, prescribing the lowest dose um, possible to control symptoms. Um, regular monitoring for hypertension or the development or worsening of prior um, blood pressure, signs of heart failure such as edema, um, worsening renal function um, or GI bleeding. Uh, and in patients uh, who are on aspirin therapy, consideration of um, adding PPI in order to reduce the risk of GI bleeding. Um, this is one of the most difficult uh, problems uh, for patients who have cardiovascular disease as well as arthritis because many folks really depend on their NSAIDs to sort of get them through the day um, because of pain. Other uh, things that may be useful, uh, non-pharmacologic interventions such as physical therapy, um, uh, uh, other supplements um, which may be useful uh, as well as um, joint injections um, can, can be um, NSAID sparing type therapy. Um, so uh, with regard to folks that come in with myocardial infarction, pharmacotherapy in older patients in particular should be individualized with dose adjustments by weight uh, and creatinine clearance to reduce adverse events caused by age-related changes in pharmacokinetic pharmacokinetics or dynamic, dynamics, the volume of distribution, their comorbidities, drug interactions, and increased drug sensitivity. Um, uh, another guideline-based recommendation is that management decisions, including um, proceeding to catheterization and, um, and further interventions, uh, should be patient-centered and consider patient preferences and goals and comorbidities, functional and cognitive status, and life life expectancy, and these are in our guidelines. So here's our summary slide, um, which recapitulates um, a slide that I um, talked to you about at the beginning of the talk. The presentation of coronary disease in older adults can be atypical. Shortness of breath is often um, uh, maybe the only symptom um, that folks have. Uh, older folks, um, sorry, women and diabetics may also be more prone to having a atypical presentations, um, and unfortunately, atypical presentations are associated with a worse prognosis, probably because of late presentation and late recognition um, that myocardial ischemia is driving those symptoms. Unfortunately, few patients um, who are over 80 have been included in randomized trials. There's more and more of an effort to try to, um, to do studies on these patients uh, because that, per that portion of the population, as you know, is, grow <laughs> is growing really dramatically. 
a large percentage of el eligible older patients are not receiving evidence-based therapy, and sometimes that's appropriate. It may be a, a joint decision between the patient and, um, and their provider, but it's important to start with a baseline of what is standard therapy and peel back from that as opposed to, um, to not even considering um, standard therapies. Um, older adults often stand to benefit the most because they are at highest risk. Um, um, but they also do have increased risk from therapy, so it's important to talk to patients about what their goals, what risks may or may not be um, acceptable to them. And secondary prevention efforts are critical in reducing the burden of coronary disease on patients and their caregivers, and that, um, uh, that um, harkens back to when we're talking about controlling cholesterol, controlling blood pressure, um, diabetes, obesity, smoking cessation, uh, and exercise intervention. These are all critically important to reducing the burden of cardiovascular disease for our patients. This is a key reference, um, which is uh, the AHA scientific statement on the secondary prevention of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in older adults. And I'm happy to take any questions. Um, actually, Fairbix, um, sorry. Fairbix came across with a question early on on that asked if the elderly lady with non-ST elevation MI was placed on a heparin drip or equivalent? Yes, that's a good question. I actually saw it in the corner of my screen. Um, and um, yes, so that, that would be appropriate therapy as well. Uh, and um, particularly, um, I would probably favor a heparin drip, um, particularly if um, if there's renal dysfunction uh, and uh, any signs of bleeding. Questions in the room here while they start picking them up out there? Do you yeah. know of any trials in the works for, uh, for um, elderly populations? Yeah, that's a great question. So do I know of any trials in the works? So um, there have been um, some smaller trials of uh, enrolling just uh, older patients, and they've had a lot of trouble enrolling, actually. Um, the current uh, there's a silver AMI trial that's ongoing um, that isn't, it's more of a, um, an observational study um, as opposed to um, randomizing specifically. Um, and that's the one that I'm most aware of right now. Do you um, know, recall what the average age was for the cardiovascular health study? Um, oh. Which was an observational study, but they were 65 and older, weren't they? Yeah. Um, but I don't know how well they did with getting much older. Um, in terms of uh, up till now, or, or the range of, of um, ages at in yeah, at just, the start um, of the study? Yeah, just what their mean age was. I couldn't remember. I, I don't mean, remember that was an either. observational study, yeah. so it wasn't a. Yeah, um, I don't remember either. Still waiting for questions, coming across other questions here in the room. Uh, um, one more for me. Um, why is diet not uh, a modifiable risk factor? Or in modifying risk factors, why isn't diet low sat fat, low trans fat? Um, yeah, a, a diet is an important intervention. Um, and I, I guess you could say uh, bad uh, or ath an atherogenic diet would be an ad, uh, sort of an adverse, um, it would be a risk factor. Um, uh, I didn't spend a, a lot of time on specific dietary interventions. Probably the best studied um, dietary intervention with regard to cardiovascular disease would be the Mediterranean diet. Um, and um, that sort of uh, forms the foundation for the American Heart Association's recommendations for, um, for risk reduction diet and that way. So um, I was trying to figure out what the question is, but I think the question from Anchorage is um, related to continued weight loss and continued benefit for diabetes. They say, you mentioned weight loss could help with diabetes, and that is what I did, and it worked for me, but I want to lose about another 10 pounds and can't get it off. I dropped a size last week, but still no more weight loss. I continue to exercise and change my diet, so I'm 
thinking maybe this person is asking about any further benefit uh, or additional benefit from weight loss? Yeah, it's hard to know. Um, certainly, those are those sound like good changes. Um, uh, and um, uh, the um, sort of that you can get big benefits from not dramatic amounts of weight loss. Um, I think uh, it's important to recognize that if you're doing significant activity that may include some resistance training, that you may actually be gaining muscle um, as well as losing fat. And so changes in your changes in body composition, um, sort of the relative of lean uh, muscle mass versus fat may even be more beneficial. So um, I think uh, it's difficult to know without details, but it may be that, um, that the, the changes are uh, are really good at, at this point and that perhaps targeting additional just weight loss might not be um, necessary. Um, okay, so I thought another question and that is the use of statins in older adults. Is there any increased risk of the sort of musculoskeletal side effects or anything like that? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, it's always hard because um, uh, oh, the question is about um, statins and, and muscle toxicity. Um, if, if you look at most of the randomized trials, um, there, don't see, there doesn't seem to be a significant increase um, in uh, adverse events in older adults. Um, there are certainly uh, more anecdotally and in um, those types of things you do see more, you do tend to see more often. Um, and again, it's, it can be very difficult to tease out if patients um, are actually having an adverse drug effect or if they're just having um, muscle pain for some other reason. I think, um, you know, uh, uh, when, there's a, when, it, when there's a question of whether a person is having um, a side effect, I'll often take them off, um, perhaps for a short period of time, have a washout period, and see if the symptoms actually get any better. And that, of course, is hard because if, if the patient is convinced that that's the reason why they're having the muscle pain, then maybe they will have sort of the a reverse placebo effect of having it off. Um, and then uh, often trying an agent, a different agent, um, uh, I'll do that as well. And sometimes it can be idiosyncratic. It doesn't necessarily have to do with um, you know, which uh, route of metabolism is um, the, the medication uses, but um, sometimes just switching to a different agent um, can be helpful. Um, I think in general, it's true that higher doses, and, and of course we're recommending sort of um, more potent therapy, higher doses are associated with more um, adverse events, adverse symptoms. Um, what is your opinion on the clinical significance of the drug interaction with clopidogrel and um, omeprazole, or as I don't know how to pronounce it. As, as omeprazole. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so the question is, um, what about the drug in, potential drug interaction um, between omeprazole and, and clopidogrel? I think it's been, um, it's been fairly well disproven. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, um, for a while we were, so um, currently, we don't really pay that much attention to it. For a while, we were just saying, well, if there's even a chance, why don't we just use a different PPI? Um, and so some people still practice that way. They'll just use, um, I apologize for using the trade name, but Protonics or, or a different um, PPI instead. But I think um, uh, the evidence is that, that there isn't a significant interaction. Okay, do we have any other questions out of the sites? Usually we can see if they're writing, but I don't see that coming across this time. Any other questions here? A question about cholesterol. Um, and at one point, I think I was hearing about that there were you couldn't just go by LDL and total cholesterol, but that there were different types of LDLs. And I was wondering where that research has gone. Different LDLs have different risk factors. Yeah, that's a good. Uh, that's a good question. The question is. Um, uh, is it as simple as sort of high LDL is bad, and are there different um, types of, of LDL? So, um, so yes, there are, and and there's a lot of research into um, sort of the uh, large buoyant LDL as opposed to the um, dense LDL. And so, um, some people, um, particularly lipid um, in lipid clinics and lipid researchers. Um,
will evaluate patients' particle size. That's evaluating particle size. Um, I think on a population basis, um, the, uh, the strength of association of just LDL is, um, is probably um, where we're at, just because the cost of looking at um, doing particle size analysis on everybody would be too high. Um, but, but functionally, they are, um, they are different, and, and, um, and the small, dense LDL uh, versus the large um, portend different um, risks. So Providence is wondering if there's an LDL level that is too low. Yeah, that's a great question. And it actually has a controversial, um, it, it's a little bit controversial. Um, many of uh, the lipid experts really don't think that there's an LDL that's too low. Um, if you look at populations um, uh, who sort of um, are untouched by, uh, quote, civilization, um, or newborns, their LDLs are quite low, sort of 30s or um, around 40, um, and, uh, and they seem to do just fine. Um, and, uh, and there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of evidence that, um, that uh, in our, LDL tr in our um, intervention trials where LDL has been driven to very low levels that, um, that there are any problems associated with that. On the other hand, we do know that we do need some LDL um, for um, sort of for our neuronal health, um, and so I, I tend to um, to back off if we're getting sort of um, to around forty. And and in fact, tar specific targets are de-emphasized in the new guidelines. It's just, um, uh, but in particular with patients who um, may be a little bit more frail or um, who you're worried about, I think it's still appropriate to look and see what has my intervention. Done done. Um, yeah. Um, Peninsula College is asking, do you recommend time spacing of doses for aspirin and NSAIDs? Do you favor naproxen versus ibuprofen? Oh, good question. So um, I don't have, um, uh, I don't have a, um, a particular non-aspirin NSAID other than sort of the non-acetylated salicylates, which anecdotally I think people tend to not feel, as, unfortunately, don't feel are as effective as, um, as uh, ibuprofen or naproxen, and I don't have a preference between those two. In terms of dosing interval, um, the half-life of um, aspirin's antiplatelet effect, anyway, is, um, is quite long, and so, um, so I, I don't think it probably um, has an impact on, um, on it if it's being taken about once a day. Wyoming is wondering if a statin drug is stopped due to muscle weakness, how long does it take for the symptoms to resolve? Yeah, that's a great question. So, and also um, doesn't have a set answer. So, uh, question being how long after stopping a statin might the muscle effects um, go away? It, it, it's very um, sort of patient and situation specific. So, um, but uh, typically I would give it about, you know, three weeks to a month off to try to reassess whether there's been any change in symptoms. Um, certainly, if there's rhabdo, then um, 